this hard space is an effort to create a space for all of your hearts to rest and find peace and find love through interactive dialogue and providing you more and more information and resources so that you can actually uh, find your beautiful space, your sacred space in your heart. And we were discussing in creating the heart space, we compare the heart to a beautiful lotus flower. And many times you may notice that lotus flowers, they grow in all kinds of spaces. Those of you who ever go to India, you'll notice that lotus flowers will grow in, in very filthy, dirty places, in dirty waters and everywhere. But the interesting part is that the lotuses themselves, they're so amazing, the beautiful and fragrant. So even though we may have a mind that is filled with many other impediments and many other uh, un, not so clean spaces and environment, but still the lotus is able to grow just like the heart is growing and can continue to grow if we simply turn around and have a beautiful glance at ourselves and how our heart is actually truly the seat of transcendental pure eternal love. So that is why we have this call called the heart space. And we want to continue to provide you more and more tools, just like a farmer. If you want to grow anything, you need to have the right tools. And then we learn to make sure that the, the ground that you grow the lotus in is fertile. And we put a little fence around this beautiful heart to make sure that sometimes the goats and other Animals can actually go and, and, and disrupt the growth of this beautiful plant that you're growing. So we give you beautiful boundaries, beautiful fences that you can make to make sure that at all levels, your heart is truly protected and, and guarded and preserved. So those are uh, the very foundation of this heart space is why we want to try and dive deeper into this, uh, this, this sacred space that we all have. In order for the heart to grow, it needs to have space. Without space, it cannot grow. Just like children, if you smother over them, they're not able to express and grow properly. So similarly, the heart and the mind needs space to grow. That means we have to try to be open to experiences in our spiritual journeys that may be a little different than what we have experienced so far in our lives. So that space that you have to give yourself in order to see yourself. Because with just like I gave this example before, if you make a big pot of soup, a massive pot, you're cooking for 500 people or 1,000 people. If you want to make a soup, you cannot be inside the pot making the soup. You have to get out of the pot so that you can make the soup. Similarly, you have to see it with an open mind to be able to see inside your heart the beauty, the love that you carry. So that's the first value of the heart space. Very important. This judgment free zone is, is very much needed because this, this, this heart will grow in all different directions 
horizontally and vertically. And it's so unique, it cannot be compared to anyone else or anything else in the world. So the uniqueness, the individuality, the distinctive individuality that each and every one of us have, that is something very, very precious to understand and realize. We make no judgments, so therefore we don't say anything to pollute the atmosphere. A beautiful part of the heart space is acknowledging the blessings that we have in our lives. You'll be surprised that when you look in the world, many people don't have hands and feet. Many people don't have food. Many people don't have the kind of shelter that we have. Friends and family, brothers and sisters. So when we have, what do we have? If we take stock of what we have, then we will naturally practice gratitude on a day-to-day -day basis, from moment to moment, from hour to hour. And through this practice, practice of gratitude, the heart will open up more and more and more. It's very beautiful because there's so much in this world that we cannot control. There is very little that we can control. We can control our reaction, our responses to whatever we are experiencing in the world. So therefore, we have to try the things that we cannot tolerate, the things that we cannot change. There's things that is completely beyond our control. The weather, the heat, the cold, you know, the, 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 the pain that is caused to the mind, the happiness and distresses that is caused to the mind, it has nothing to do with us. So we have to simply try to, try to uh, be an observer of that rather than indulging in it and overly contemplating on it. Big, beautiful part of the heart space is whenever we share, we value everyone's heart so much that we hold it so dear. Because in order to share something, it requires courage. And the heart is heart space is always inspiring and lifting others. So when someone shares, we hold that to be very, very sacred. That means they have instilled their trust, their faith in us, and therefore, we hold it sacred. We don't start to tell and, 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 and break that confidentiality because the heart needs that space. Because it can grow in all different ways. Individual hearts. So it's actually very vital that we always maintain the sanctity of others' hearts when they share anything in the group or to us personally. Does anyone have any questions on those? Yeah, sorry. Uh, just about gossip. When we uh, talk to other persons about, um, um, about things that happen or that are uh, caused by other people to us, is that gossip or where is the line between uh, explaining to somebody what, what happened um, it is gossip when you take pleasure in sharing others' discrepancies in life. When people are have done something wrong or you are looking at them in a very critical way, because there's an objectivity in gossip. The very fact you gossip means it does not have a unique purpose to the cultivation of the beautiful heart that we have. It does not serve your heart and it's just, you know, someone said, he said, she said, I heard it. These are not something that serves the heart. Yeah. Okay. So therefore it becomes, according to this yoga sage, who beautifully explains, beautifully describing, describing what is gossip, and he calls it prajalpa. That means anything that does not cultivate and nurture the unique purpose of 
the individual's heart. So just like, for example, we can just sit and talk about politics or he said, she said, how is that going to cultivate and nurture the heart? So these are uh, very beautifully thought out values for the heart space that I did not personally come up with. The sages have come up with certain criteria to make sure that the heart can grow very nicely. So we are covering the, the, the nine petal lotus. The heart is in the shape of a lotus. Everyone remembers this? This is what the heart actually looks like. It's called the Anahata Chakra. And it has a very, very powerful uh, nine principles. And we are still discussing the first principle and we'll try and discuss the first principle till because there's so much coverage to the heart, so much. And the first principle is Shravanam. It has nine petal lotuses, right? You can see it. So the first one is Shravanam or hearing. And we covered the difference between hearing and listening and listening from the heart, which is Shravanam. And listening from the heart, we covered last week. So now we're going to go in a little bit deeper. How is it possible to listen from the heart? We're going to answer the question, how? Because it is not very easy to listen from the heart. Why is it not very easy? Long time ago, I was told this beautiful metaphor. I was told that it's a native Indian metaphor. But then I also found out that it also has a, a very Vedic metaphor as well. And they give the metaphor of two dogs. If you have two dogs in your house, there is a dog and sitting on one part of the house and there's another dog sitting in the other part of the house. And they're both barking. There is a dog that is barking extremely loud, nonstop wanting your attention. And there's another dog sitting in the other corner, just simply whimpering, not so loud. So who would you pay attention to more? Obviously the dog that barks the loudest. That is human tendency. They say in America, the wheel that squeaks the most gets the grease or gets the oil. Did you all hear that expression? Normally, if a wheel is squeaking, you're going to pause and try and put some grease to make sure it doesn't squeak. So, the wheel that makes the loudest noise gets the grease. So, similarly, this dog in your house that barks the loudest will get your attention. So, the metaphor is given of the mind and the heart. The mind has thousands and thousands of thoughts that are going nonstop from one thing to another. And the funny thing is that it gets louder and louder. Why does it get louder? Because you're not giving it attention. And the funny thing is the minute you give attention, it gets louder because it's not satisfied. So the mind is constantly providing you one scenario after another and creating an array of ripples of thoughts from no one likes me to Richard never calls me because he must definitely not like the way I smile at him. And I know why he doesn't like my smile is because I have bad teeth. And I know I don't have, I have bad teeth is because when I was young, I didn't brush my teeth properly. And then, you know, I know why I didn't brush my teeth because no one told me. And, you know, the reason no one told me is because no one ever liked me. And why doesn't everyone like me is because I'm a bad kid. And and why, why am I a bad kid is because God never wanted me in the first place. And then 
Why did God never like me? And then we just go on and on and on and on and on and create a narrative in our mind that has absolutely nothing to do with the reality. But it goes louder and louder and louder and louder. So therefore, because the mind is constantly contemplating on thoughts, and those thoughts are created by the objects that are provided to us by our senses. We see something with our eyes and we are distracted. We hear something and then the thoughts create. You know, someone such and such is so successful and look at me. I have not made it there. This is why I didn't make it. And then we self-deprecate ourselves. And we go through this process, digging ourselves in a, in, a, in a massive trench. So this is why we are not able to go through and experience the beauty in the heart. is because there is no silence. How can anyone hear anything if there is no silence? How can you hear the heart? What it's saying to you? What is your conscience speaking to you? How can we know what it is if there's no silence in our lives? So it's very important in principle, that is, if you want to get in touch with your heart and truly understand what is the essence of your life, what is the source of the love and the value that you have, we have to understand silence. Because that silence, when we experience that silence, then we can truly hear the super soul in the heart. We can truly hear, and in yoga, they call it the paramatma. We can truly hear the paramatma in the heart. And otherwise, it's very difficult because it is all over the place. And so how do we silence the mind and the intelligence so that we can truly hear the heart. Because if we want to listen to the heart, you know, the doctors, they have to use a device to directly place it over your heart. So we have to have something that is very closely connected to the heart. And the two common principles that in this uh, uh, in this discussion we want to try and explore is these two principles. One is the principle of acceptance. And the second is the principle of surrender. And of course, we're going to go in depth into these two principles. In life, if we want to hear the heart, if we truly want to experience a beautiful divine dialogue in your heart between you and the divine, the soul and the super soul, the atma, the self, and the paramatma and the supreme self. These principles are very, very uh, fundamental and powerful. Acceptance. Why is it that we should accept anything? Because if we don't accept, what we're doing is we're constantly fighting. And fighting takes a lot of effort. Because nothing in this world is going to ever satisfy the mind and the senses. The mind and the senses, according to the teachings of Bhagavad Gita, is not meant to be satisfied. Because if the mind and the senses, they are dominating our existence, they will never be satiated. Because the mind and the senses are looking at the world from the outside. And everything outside that we see, that we hear, that we smell, has a temporary shelf life, has an expired date. And when we interact with the senses and the sense objects outside, what happens is that we are very disappointed. And, and 
And what happens is we are always let down. I heard this expression called a dented can. And I didn't understand. So when I went to Walmart one time and I saw a big, huge shopping cart and it says for sale or on sale. And I was wondering why is the same thing on the shelf more expensive than the ones in here? And someone told me they're all dented probably fell on the ground and has a dent. So it loses its value. And then someone else also explained to me that expression of a dent, dented can is when someone is hurt and there's this pain and suffering, so they're not no longer able to be their original self and they get kicked around. So they call it the dented kicked can. I don't, I'm learning American expressions. And I thought, how sad is that? That in this world, in our pursuit of trying to gratify and indulge with the objects based on our flawed senses, we become dented and then we get kicked around. So therefore, we are always trying to find perfection in a place that is imperfect. We're trying to find something that is perfect with the senses that are imperfect. We can't see properly with our eyes. We cannot always hear everything properly with our ears. We cannot see everything uh, objectively. Everything is subjective. And so, therefore, we're not being able to experience the reality. And we want the absolute truth. We want the reality, but we are not able to. And so we're constantly fighting back. We're just rejecting everything. And people sometimes in this world try to wonder why no one loves them. Everyone is looking for love and no one finds that love. And when that love is coming towards you, we reject it. Because we're so afraid of love. Because, you know, once the plant, when you don't put a fence, your heart is like a beautiful plant. When someone goes and starts tampering with it, you're like, okay, from now onwards, no one's going to get close to it. So we put like, you know, bigger and bigger walls. So this acceptance is a very, very important quality. In, in, in really understanding, you know, the universal plan in our lives. Acceptance means to understand that everything in this world has a very unique purpose. I may not know what it is, but let me just give it the benefit of the doubt. It is here for a reason. Let me try to understand how this will serve the purpose of my life. And if it does not serve the purpose, then we can reject it because that's the principle of the heart. If it doesn't serve the purpose of the heart, then sorry, you know, it doesn't have place. But it does have to go through the process of asking that question. And that's why the process of self-inquiry is a big part of what we are doing with this heart space. We want to give you some more questions to ask with everything that we do. And then the second principle is this principle of surrender. Acceptance comes from primarily from the mind and the intelligence because you're able to rationalize. You are asking questions. Does Richard really like me? What are the symptoms that indicate that Richard really likes me? If he liked me, why did he just take off and go to Japan? So we go through this process with our intelligence, try to analyze what its unique purpose is. And then we go through the process of acceptance. I understand Richard has you know, his personal dreams. He, he doesn't want to be in an ashram life in Atlanta. 
he wants to pursue this and he should go on his own journey and his personal experiences. So we rationalize with our intelligence and we accept. And this is happening in our mind and our intelligence. That Richard wasn't, it wasn't on an ego trip that he just wanted to ditch me. So it's not something that is, uh, that is personal, or rather, it's a very rational process. So that is where acceptance comes from. And then surrender is coming from the heart. And how is it that, because the surrender is very deep, and we will also be studying this as it's actually one of the petals of the lotus. So we're going to get into depth. But the surrender is very important. It means surrendering to the divine plan. And it's coming from the heart. After it has gone through the process of the mind and intelligence, then it enters the heart where we are truly able to accept that Richard is on a personal spiritual journey. And I truly admire and respect the journey of his heart. And he's been called by the divine to go and teach in Japan. And I truly genuinely accept him as who he is, as what he is, and what he is doing in his, with his life. And this is very, very deep. Most people, when they ask for advice, we want to give them advice and turn their direction to what we think is right. Most people want to give advice, but the heart does not give advice. The mind and the intelligence will give advice, most definitely. But the, what the heart is doing is accepting the individual soul's spiritual journey. And it is tremendously powerful to understand that individuals go on a journey of the heart. And they have to allow others to take that beautiful journey of the heart. So this is what surrender means. Surrender means a place where someone is given that full space to express the personal spiritual journey. When, we're, when they're asked for advice, then we do not speak from our intelligence or our mind. We simply share our heart. Again, there is no advice. We are simply helping to share our journey with them. And this also we'll be studying later on as part of the six loving exchanges of bhakti, of the heart space. So this is our discussion for today and understanding the, the very important principle of silence in order to really get and get to the heart and to hear the heart speak. And in bhakti, you will notice in this practice that we are going through, you will notice the more and more deeper you go into your spiritual journey, the more and more quieter you will get. You will simply want to hear what others have to share because you will hold that space for them. And that's what love does. That's what bhakti does. It holds a very beautiful sacred space for others to grow. Not you to grow and pull them down, but you help others to grow all around you. And that is what bhakti is all about. And this is what this heart space is all about. So we have a few minutes for questions and answers. And then we may have... Would anyone have any more questions to this topic that we just shared? The silence and acceptance and surrender. If there is no questions, then 
We have 15 minutes. So it's very difficult to be in your heart space if you have had an experience of a trauma and, you know, and then you have to deal inside with your trauma and the, bar, the outside world. And uh, this too is a very difficult combination to be in your heart space and to be silent in the silence because the trauma is just controlling our lives. So how do you think, what do we need to do with that? See, we all in this material world will have uh, some traumas. Because we are dented cans, right? Dented so cans. The expression goes, dented mm -hmm. can. So when a can is dented, then it gets kicked around, it gets re-traumatized, or it mm -hmm. gets shoved to a corner. Mm -hmm. Because no one wants to touch it. And whoever touches it does not value it. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a very interesting question that you ask. How do you find the heart space when you're when when we go have all these traumas in our lives? Mm -hmm. So first we have to understand the trauma is a universal thing. Everyone has trauma. And how we process that trauma is going to be very, very critical to <clears throat> quality of life that we, we will get a chance to live. And so therefore, in this process, we need to always seek out teachers and seek out friends who will help us to elevate ourselves and get over the traumas. And, you know, as you know, that we do have a Vedic curriculum that is very much geared towards addressing that unique problem of traumas in our lives. And that is called the Chitta Cleanse. If you go to chittacleanse.com, then there's more details. And, you know, it's a very ancient yoga practice process that enables us to gradually, step by step, slowly, 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 gradually be able to process that. That is the practical side on how to go through the processing. The other important part of getting over traumas is taking shelter of the heart. Taking shelter of the heart means the traumas are caused by the mind and the intelligence. Taking shelter of the heart means taking shelter of this unique spiritual meditation called the heart space meditation. And Kamala Devi and many others, Ashtavi Devi can and they teach you the heart space meditation, how to sincerely spend time in your heart through your heart space meditation. And then eventually the traumas that we have experienced will generally just quiet down. And because you have taken shelter of the heart, and heart is the seed of the divine, and you get divine assistance to process and to get over these difficulties and these difficult trials. Because when we are in a bad space, we are not the solution. We need company. And in the company of satsanga, in the company of good association, then we are able to then transcend and overcome these challenges and difficulties. It's very, very clear when the saints are writing, the word sangha or satsanga is very, very powerful. They emphasize, always have good association. Good association creates pearls. Good association creates harmony. Good association creates community. Good association creates the environment of love, acceptance. And the whole world will become one big family if we all have good association. Association is the key to success in life. If you want to be a rich person, you hang out with people who are rich. 
You want to be an athlete, you hang out with athletes. You want to be a coder, you hang out with people who do coding. You want to be a surfer, you hang out with surfers. So this association is very, very, very important. And that is why this hard space uh, sangha that we have, we want people to come in and share their hearts and grow together and create a space for themselves and others to grow. So short answer to your long, beautiful, I mean, long answer to your beautiful question, Anandini, is there's some practical steps, is your sadhana, and engaged in seva, serving others, and serving the divine, and the sangha. Sadhana, seva, and sangha. So this, when you have this three, what comes is something called sadachar. In yoga, we understand. Sad, S-A-D, like sad. Achar means character. When you do sadhana, when you have good sadhana, spiritual practice to cultivate your heart, and then good association, and you're engaged in serving, then what happens, you become the walking sadachar, the walking character person who is embodying all these divine qualities. So sadachar is the, the result of following the three S's or the three uh, pillars of heart space.